So I am introducing Evelyn Lamb. Evelyn is a freelance math and science writer based in Salt Lake City. She earned her PhD in mathematics at Rice University in 2012 and taught at the University of Utah until 2015. Evelyn began her science writing career in 2012 with a fellowship at Scientific American. She has written for outlets including Scientific American, Slate, Nature, News, Muse, Nautilus, and Smithsonian. She writes the blog Roots of Unity, and hopefully you remember your trig, for Scientific American, which turned five this year, and hosts many blogs like a few of my favorite spaces, and math, a given mathematician's favorite theorem, which is very, very fun to read, and contributes to the blog on math blogs for the American Mathematical Society. Her work has appeared in the best writing on mathematics anthology, and she co-hosts the My Favorite Theorem podcast with Kevin Knudsen. Evelyn has stated in an interview with the American Mathematical Society in 2017, I was lucky to be born into a geeky family, and even though I have those teenage years of feeling like nobody understood me, in reality, I've been fortunate at every stage in my life to have wonderful friends who love me for, not in spite of my geekiness. So hopefully you'll give her a geeky round of applause. <laughs> Evelyn. Yes, thank you. So um, I hope geekiness is welcome here. It definitely seems like it. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, it, it's exciting to be here. I'm, I have actually not been to the Taylorsville campus um, down here before. Uh, so that was a new adventure. I'm recently um, not a person with a car, so I also got to learn a new bus route, and that's always exciting. Um, yeah, so I'm glad to be here. Really impressed by all of the different work people here have done. Um, and yeah, I like uh, one of the other people. I'm considering possibly washing one of those water bottles. We'll see. I'm not going to go to any two major extremes, but like maybe that's a good idea. So I, um, tonight I want to talk to you a little bit about kind of my career journey in math. I know not everyone here is in math. Other people are maybe looking at other STEM fields. I think a lot of um, what I do is, you know, related to those as well. And so my personal background is, is math, but hopefully um, if you're interested in bio or health or something else, it'll be applicable. I'll talk a little bit about kind of how I got where I got. Um, and then uh, a little bit, of, so my, my career is in writing and communication, so a little bit about kind some tips about writing and communication. I know that part of the purpose of this uh, event is to, you know, practice communicating and stuff, and so kind of throw in, uh, you know, it's always a little nerve-wracking to be giving a talk about talking and communicating well, because like, oh, what if your talk isn't that good? And they're like, oh, why is she giving me advice about talking good if she's not talking good? So, um, and, and you know, if your, your career is writing, if you go read my things and you're like, oh, you didn't do this thing that you said to do, like, you know, just in all things, do as I say, not as I do. Um, so the, the main point of this talk, I feel like a lot of talks about career is that you know, you might have one idea of like what your career path is going to be and what success is going to mean in your life and then your life kind of ends up going a different way and, and actually I keep meaning to revise this graphic to, to have the arrow pointing kind of in a completely different direction at the end in addition to, you know, spiraling around. Um, I am really happy in my career now, and it's not, it's kind of not a career I even knew existed when I was thinking about what I wanted to do when I grew up, um, and it's maybe not what I envisioned for success for myself at the beginning, but um, I'm really happy in it now, and so that might be true for you too. Um, so we want, we are, we're going to go back to 1992 when I was uh, a young child, and I, had probably the most specific career goal I ever had in my life, which was that I was going to be a herpetologist, which is someone who studies um, reptiles and amphibians, and I was going to discover the cure for AIDS in snake venom in the Amazon. 
Um, so of course, <laughs> you know, like uh, the assumption that the cure for AIDS exists in snake venom in the Amazon somewhere, you know, hasn't been disproven yet. I'm just saying. Um, so, uh, you know, they say to set uh, specific goals. Uh, so as a nine-year-old, I was very specific about that. But um, as I got older, it changed a little. I, this is a beaker in my hand. I realize uh, you, you might notice that the uh, career goal is never cartoonist or artist. Um, and, and this might give you a little, uh, it, it looks like a rude gesture. It, it could look like a rude gesture. It could also look like a thumbs up, you know, the, Gestures can be hard to, to tell from a cartoon. But I went to a math and science high school, um, and at that point I was really, I kind of brought it, you know, I wasn't quite so laser focused on the snake venom thing, um, and was more interested in biochemistry in general, and really interested in nutrition research. Um, I went to Baylor, where I uh, entered as a biochemistry and church music major. Um, because why not? I've always enjoyed music and church music. Um, I still wanted to be a biochemist, but I, I had a viola scholarship, and so um, having a music major was part of that, too. Um, I kind of fairly quickly realized that the reason I wasn't, you know, I, I would go to a, an organic chemistry class or a biochemistry class or cell biology, I just kept kind of banging my head against the wall on it. And no offense to the bio people out here, like, you're wonderful. But I realize that, like, it's not you, it's me. Like, I'm just not interested in doing biology and biochem. And eventually got really lucky that I uh, took a math class that kind of gave me this brain explosion of, like, seeing math as a creative subject where you you know, rather than, I had always had this picture that you kind of, you have a problem and you learned something to do and then the answer falls out and you go on to the next problem and very kind of mechanical, hadn't seen it as a creative process. Um, but I took a class, you know, a lot of people in uh, science careers or, or any careers in general have this story that that's kind of this, oh, there was this one special professor that, or one special teacher that made me feel like I could do this. Um, so I definitely felt that way. I, Dr. Rains at Baylor, uh, shout out there. Um, and he really opened my eyes to seeing math in a, a different way. And it, it was almost like one of those road to Damascus things where like, oh, now I'm converted and now I have to be a mathematician forever. Um, but I, I did, you know, it, it's easy to look back and say, like, that's what happened. But I did, it took me a while to uh, decide what I wanted to do going forward. Um, I did end up going to uh, finishing um, at Baylor a, in kind of an interdisciplinary program that had a lot of music theory and um, music stuff in addition to math. Um, but I decided to go to grad school in math instead of music theory because I thought it would make me more employable at the end, which is probably correct, which is probably more of a, a comment on, you know, what our society values than, like, what the intrinsic worth of either one of these disciplines is. Um, and I decided I, I wanted to do math. Um, I, I went to Rice, and I, I kind of saw a tenured math professor as the one career goal that a person going to grad school in math should have, and so that was my career goal. Um, and I, I graduated from Rice. It was difficult. I had, uh, you know, had some difficulties, didn't get help when I needed it um, for both, like, personal and academic things, um, and felt a lot of shame about how long it took me and everything, but I eventually did make it, and turns out at the end they still call you doctor. Um, <laughs> whether you take four years or seven. Um, and I was really starting to question whether a tenured math professor was what I wanted. Um, I felt kind of constrained by, you know, felt like I didn't have a lot of options for crea creativity in the problem that I was working on, and I couldn't really see a way out of that. Um, and I kind of knew that what I should want was to be a math professor, but it really, didn't seem like it was going to happen for me and didn't seem like I would be fulfilled um, if I did that. 
And I had another one of those brain explosion moments that came at a really fortunate time for me um, with uh, a mass media fellowship where I got to work at Scientific American for the summer. Um, and once again, we can almost, I can think of this as like a road to Damascus, like my eyes were opened and I, uh, I guess in that story he goes blind, right? Well, don't, we'll, we'll not be too literal about it. Um, but I suddenly saw uh, science writing as a, a career that I got along with my editors at Scientific American really well. Um, what I just felt very fulfilled um, in doing that. I did have a job lined up at the University of Utah after that, and so um, that's where I went in 2013, and I uh, taught there, did some research, um, but I also uh, did some blogging on the side, and I could kind of tell like that really um, moving forward on the academic career path wasn't going to be the best thing for me. Um, so finally, in 2015, I asked myself, like, what would I do if I weren't afraid? I was afraid that I was wasting my education if I did something else, which is ridiculous, honestly. I use my, my math background every single day in my job. So I, you know, <laughs> I'm not wasting it. But there's some, somehow this, it's very easy to, to get in your mind that there's one um, possibility for success and one definition of what success looks like. Um, and that definition wasn't really very personally fulfilling to me, but I felt like that was what I should want to do. So when I finally asked myself, like, if you weren't afraid of, you know, disappointing people or disappointing yourself or, you know, anything like that, what do you do? And the answer was I'd dye my hair blue and leave my job. Um, so I, I decided to do freelance writing full time. Um, I uh, left um, in December 2015. I taught my last class, which was very bittersweet because it was one of my very favorite classes to teach. I had a ton of fun doing it, um, but I was really excited to move on to the next thing. Um, and so yeah, now I'm a freelance math writer. Um, I occasionally write about other, other science topics too, but mostly math. Um, and kind of like why writing became the math career for me um, was partly because of the creativity. That was what had drawn me to math in the first place. I've always seen myself as a creative person, you know, doing music. As a kid, I, uh, you know, put on ridiculous plays with my siblings and, um, you know, made like drawings everywhere, learn to sew, just, I, I always like to create things. Um, and math is a really great place to be creative. Science in general is a great place to be creative. Maybe not what people think of as creative careers sometimes, but there's a lot of creativity in it, generating the ideas there and um, working, working through the different possibilities when you're doing a math proof and things like that. Um, but writing was better for me in part because I'm also driven by novelty. I guess it's not as much writing necessarily, but not being an academic. Um, because in, at least uh, for me, the research that I was doing, I didn't feel like I was getting to think about new things all the time. In research, often what you're doing is kind of drilling down into one problem deeper and deeper, and that can be really fulfilling for some people, and it just wasn't for me. I wanted to think about something for half an hour and then go think about something else, and that's kind of how my day goes now. Um, and so kind of that balance of creativity and novelty was really what made this a good uh, career for me. Um, so of course, uh, I want to talk about why I love this job. Um, so one of them is helping people have a positive experience with math. I think all of us, maybe some of us in this room, um, if not individually, we definitely know someone like this um, who's had a really uh, traumatic experience with math. Sometimes if you're a, a mathematician or a math teacher, you'll get on a plane and like someone asks what you do and if you tell them what you do, um, they'll, they'll, you kind of become, a, it's a confessional or you become their therapist. And they're like, oh, I, you know, the so-and-so teacher in whatever grade made me feel like I couldn't do this. Or just like, I got to this point in math and I just stopped and I couldn't, you know, there's this 
spiritual wound. That's a, a phrase I'm borrowing from Julie Raymeyer. She's a mathematician and, and math writer that I really admire a lot, and science writer too. Um, and I'm, I'm going to read this whole quote because it, it really, when I, I saw this that she had written, it really felt made me feel like I was understanding why one of the big reasons I want to do this job. Um, so she says, I find it especially meaningful to write about mathematics and statistics because so many people have had wounding experiences with them in school. It gives me such enormous pleasure when someone says, I read your article and you know I just don't have a math brain and I hate math but I, I feel like I understood it and it was pretty fun. To me when people come to believe they're terrible at math, they're suffering from a wound that's ultimately a spiritual one. They've been convinced that their ability to find pattern and meaning in the world is somehow fundamentally flawed. The impacts of that kind of wound go far beyond anxiety when it comes to calculating a tip or balancing a checkbook. In a background way, often unnoticed, it saps people's power, makes it harder for them to access their deepest selves and bring that into the world. And actually on a personal level, I really, um, my mom is one of these people who is a brilliant person and had bad experiences in math class and feels like there's a part of her that is blocked from being able to do this. Um, and so one of the reasons I write is that I want to help people like my mom have positive experiences with math. Um, yeah, uh, oh, the end of this quote, sorry. Uh, so, so when someone is able to follow one of my stories and find a bit of joy in it, I hope that wound, that wound heals a bit. I hope in some small way that it bolsters people's confidence in themselves and it shows them the joy and power of mathematics is available for them too. Um, and that's a really big motivator for what I do. And I think for a lot of people who talk or write about math or science in general, um, or teach of course, because many, many people, that's their, their way of doing that, is try to help people have that positive experience with the subject and see themselves as people who can own part of that knowledge. Um, I really like, as, as I mentioned, I really like novelty, just doing a, a wide range of things. Um, I've had a, a couple new things come onto my desk just in the past couple days. So like today, I worked on an article that um, is about the history, or mostly the recent history of math and physics and kind of how those are related. Um, one about a um, mathematician from the 1700s who was one of the first women in math and um, wrote one of the first calculus textbooks and an article um, about this new problem in graph coloring. Uh, so like three really different things all related to math, um, but it kind of gets, you know, gets my neurons firing in different ways all the time. I really like to um, the creativity that I get to do, finding new ways to communicate math to other people and kind of showing connections between math and other parts of life. So one of my favorite things I've done is make this quiz, which unfortunately is defunct because the quiz platform I used got weird and I haven't quite gotten fixed it yet. Um, but I did this quiz where you like, you take a quote that's either about math or poetry and you try to figure out which word goes in the blank. Um, so this is one of the examples. So blank feel that they know what blank is, but find it difficult to give a good direct definition. So do we think that that is about poets and poetry or mathematics uh, or mathematicians and mathematics? So let's, poetry. Okay, math. Okay, yeah, it was math. This is from uh, Bill Thurston, who was a famous mathematician who passed away uh, about six years ago, I think. Um, there are a lot of things like this. You can kind of see how it could go either way. And you know, the, the purpose of this was not just to show that uh, math and poetry are, are have something in common, because what they have in common is very abstract, um, but to, to kind of show the way that they're both creative endeavors, the people who do them approach them creatively. Um, and so like uh, this quiz, the average score I think was 55% on it, um, something around there. I, when I took it, I, I wrote it, um, and when I took it, I would get about 75% generally, because um, it's hard to remember and a lot of them really do make sense for either one. Another one that I'm especially proud of, I really just have a, a burning need to show you my cartoons, um, is uh, this one where, um, 
that this is a, an Im incredibly impractical way to prove to yourself that the world is a sphere. So you use something called um, the Euler uh, characteristic or Euler's formula. So this is something when you triangulate a, a, a large surface that has the, the basic shape of a sphere. It could be like a cube or something, but something like that that's like one piece um, and no holes in it. Um, so if you draw a, a bunch of triangles on it, actually you could draw any shapes, draw a bunch of things on it. So you've got vertices, lines, and faces in your triangulation. Um, if you uh, add up vertices, subtract edges, and add faces, you'll always get the number two. Um, so you can try this at home. You can do this with like little kids or like fun activities using this. So um, this is a way that if you don't have a spaceship to like take this picture of the Earth that to prove to yourself that it's a sphere, um, this is a way that you could prove to yourself that it's a sphere. Um, I wrote this article around the time a couple years ago that a rapper um, decided that he wanted to share with the world that he was a little skeptical about the shape of the. I don't think he was like dead set that it was flat, but just like you know, the evidence isn't isn't completely in yet. So this is a way that he could have you know gotten some friends, penguins, people in boats, things like that, to like find the Euler characteristic of the Earth and figure out that it is indeed a sphere. Um, I really like interviewing mathematicians. Um, I really like uh, showing that, you know, when people picture mathematicians, they probably picture kind of an old white guy. Um, you know, it's fair, there are a lot of old white guys who do math, um, but there are also a lot of other people who do math. I really like, um, and, and it's also not always people who grew up knowing that they really liked math. Just like I, I didn't grow up knowing I really liked math. Um, and there are, there are many ways into math. There are many ways into other sciences as well. Um, and I uh, really like reaching a very large audience. Um, and I, I feel a weird about the way that, that this is phrased um, because there's not like a hierarchy of like it's better to talk to more people. You know, people in a classroom are like when you're teaching, you're doing a very different job than someone who's writing joke articles about getting penguins to figure out the shape of the earth. Uh, you know, as you're like <laughs> communicating with with people differently. They they have different needs and and you know, what they want to get out of it. But for me, it's really fulfilling to kind of you know, have a, a small impact on a lot of people and, um, you know, show people who haven't deliberately chosen to be in your math class how math might relate to their life. Um, and I also, I'm like already annoyed at myself for this one. Um, like creating accurate stories in the clickbait era, I, I just can't stand that phrase. I was annoyed when I wrote it, I'm annoyed now. But, um, you know, there is a problem, especially with the, like the internet, makes it possible for anyone to say pretty much anything, and many people do, about every possible topic. Um, and I, you know, I really value being able to put out what I hope are high quality, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in putting accurate things out so that people can make informed decisions about their life. You know, we, we see things on the internet and we read them and think they're true, um, and so if there are, things on the internet that are high quality, that's better than if there aren't. Um, and so, uh, you know, trying to, I, I feel like I have a positive impact on society by paying attention to facts. <laughs> Weird. So, um, uh, speaking of which, uh, I wanted to take, you know, I, I used to have a slide in this talk that was like all these, this like list of boring things that's like, how being in math prepared me for a writing career, but I actually think a lot of them come together in this one story. Um, so this is where I'm gonna go over to a video um, and we will see, I should probably plug in the audio to it also. If you open any history book on mathematics, it will tell you that the ancient Greeks discovered trigonometry. Our research into this Babylonian tablet is going to change all of that. Plimpton 322 is a 3,700 year old fragment of clay from the old Babylonian period, and it's a scientific marvel of the ancient world. We've known for decades that its unusual sequence of numbers proves that the Babylonians knew the Pythagorean theorem a thousand years before Pythagoras was born. But while there is agreement on what the tablet contains, there's been no agreement on what it was used for. Our research shows 
that it's a trigonometric table, so unfamiliar and advanced that in some respects it's superior even to modern trigonometry. We've discovered that these lines represent the ratios for a series of right angle triangles, ranging from almost a square to almost a flat line. This makes Plimpton 322 a powerful tool that could have been used for surveying fields or architectural calculations to build palaces, temples, or step pyramids. The Babylonians' unique approach to arithmetic and geometry means that this is not only the world's oldest trigonometric table, it is also the only completely accurate trigonometric table on record. Why? It all comes down to fractions. We count in base 10, which only has two exact fractions, one half, which is 0.5, and one fifth, which is 0.2. That's problematic if you want to divide, for example, $1 divided by 3 is 33 cents, with 1 cent left over. The Babylonians counted in base 60, the same system that we use for telling time. This has many more exact fractions. It doesn't sound like much, but this allowed them to do a lot more exact division. 1 hour divided by 3 is 20 minutes, exactly. By using this system, the Babylonians were able to make calculations that completely avoided any inexact numbers, thereby avoiding any errors associated with multiplying those numbers. With this greater accuracy, we think this system has enormous potential for applications in surveying, computers, and education. It's rare that the ancient world teaches us something new. After 3,000 years, Babylonian mathematics might just be coming back into fashion. high production value kind of, you know, appealing video, but it really wasn't very good. Um, I, so uh, I wrote an article about it later um, that, you know, that really a lot of, of what the people claimed in that video, the, or he claimed in the video, the people who wrote it claimed was just either nonsensical, like that exact fraction bit is, like, it, it's sort of sensical, but it's sort of not also. It, um, it's very weird. Um, and he kind of claims that, uh, like, the Babylonians were more, had more accurate trig tables than we do now, but that's not true. Um, so there, there's a lot of misleading things in that. Um, and so I wrote about it. I was, I was probably pretty cranky when I wrote it, so um, don't, don't judge me. Uh, like as being super cranky if you, you read this and see how cranky I was when I wrote it. Um, but my math background really uh, gave me some tools when, when I saw this, because it's very appealing, you know, and like who can actually read this, the scientific article if you're just reading it, even if you read their article, you don't know the history of that field, of that study. Um, and so one of the things that my math background gave me was a, uh, what I call a BS detector, a kind of a skepticism about claims like this that, oh, this Babylonian tablet is going to revolutionize trigonometry. Like, that seems a little much. Um, and so kind of a healthy skepticism about that. But my background also, I had taught math history, and I'd actually taught about this very tablet in my math history class. And so I knew who to talk to um, what, whose pe papers to read, things like that, or, you know, even for things that I don't already have some background in, like this one, I kind of know who might know, um, and so my math background really helped me with that, so I felt like this was a good example of that. Also, the, the clickbait thing, um, but yeah, that, uh, may, maybe I just wanted to be cranky about, um, that guy again. Yeah, I mean, this tablet is really cool, and it is really neat that they use, ba well, first of all, Base 60 is pretty fun, um, not lying about that. It's also cool that you can learn their number system pretty quickly. Uh, it's very, it's similar to tallying in some ways, and so it's not like trying to learn a totally new alphabet or something. Um, but it is also really cool, like how large some of the numbers were that they put, they found these Pythagorean triple, what we would call now Pythagorean triples, numbers that satisfy a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where they could be the lengths of right triangles. Um, so it's actually a really cool tablet, and so I'm glad that this thing made people learn about the tablet, but, but yeah, like, there, it was a bit cranky. I was a bit cranky. Um, so yeah, I didn't know that math writing existed as a career before I started doing it. Um, so I wanted to kind of 
talk about what I did. I, I was going to be like, oh, this is what I did today. And like today, what I did was I sent 5,000 emails um, and <laughs> received 5,000 emails. So mostly, apparently, uh, math writing is emails. Um, but that's not actually true. I also, <laughs> I do a lot of emails. I also do a ton of reading. Um, I read a lot of um, literature to kind of just help me see how people use words. I, I read math and science books and journals and math blogs and popular science magazines. Um, I do a lot of interviews for my work, especially things that are more journalism um, rather than opinion things like this guy is wrong about Plimpton 322. Um, and then today I did several interviews for one of the articles I'm writing soon. Um, I do a lot of editing, um, which means kind of, well, Someone else tears up your work or you tear up your own work and try to make it better. Um, it's great and it also hurts a lot. Um, I do a lot of pitching, which is something I didn't know existed. Like in order for people to publish your awesome work, they have to know that you have an, some awesome idea for what to do. Um, and so a lot of that is kind of selling my ideas to people, trying to convince them that they want to pay me to write them, um, which is fun. No, it's very stressful. So uh, production, which is basically asking myself, why doesn't the spacing look right on this thing? Uh, so you know, when I'm writing blogs and things, I mostly do the H very basic HTML kind of things. And of course, it never works right the first time. So it's a lot of troubleshooting. Um, I do a lot of self-promotion and like doing social media things, which is a you know like I don't know businessy way of saying that I make silly math jokes on Twitter. Um, lots of fun, look me up. Um, and then m the least favorite part of my job, uh, except for when I actually get a paycheck in the mail, um, is like doing the finance things and the tax things and all of those things that, you know, there's a reason I was good at math, but I didn't go into accounting. Um, and yeah, it's because I don't like that. And then, of course, after all the rest, or hopefully before all the rest, is actually writing the thing. To me, that's the hardest part. I don't know other, I feel like th maybe some writers are more natural writers and some are more natural editors. For me, like once it gets to the editing stage, I'm fine with like tearing it out and rewriting it and stuff, but like getting the words down on the paper at first is really hard for me. Um, so there are a lot of different things that you can do as a math you know, in math and science writing, many of which are uh, compatible with other careers. Um, so some of the uh, types of things I've done, I've actually never made videos. But other than that, I've kind of done all of these things, podcasts, slideshows, book reviews, longer feature articles, things like that. So there are kind of a lot of different directions to go. And there are also a lot of different careers that combine math and science communication, um, possibly, uh, you know, by themselves, like my job of being a journalist or writer. Um, but, you know, there are editing careers, museum exhibit designer, which sounds really fun, and I don't know how to do that job. Um, seems like it would be great. But, um, you know, being a, a teacher uh, or professor, a lot of that is communicating about math and science. I mean, assuming you're not an English professor or something. Um, blogging on the side is an increasingly uh, popular thing to do where you can kind of give people a, a feeling for your research or the processes that you use. And of course, being Vi Hart is a very special career that so far only one person has managed. Um, if, you haven't, if you haven't heard of Vi Hart, you are very lucky today because Vi Hart is a very cool um, math video maker person. Um, and you should, you should probably leave right now and just go watch her videos instead of watching me talk. No, don't do that. It would hurt my feelings. Um, but yeah, she's very cool, and you should look at her stuff. Um, so now this is the part of the talk that I call how to write math good and do other stuff good too. And you know, for math, you can think of other science things too. Um, and so first of all, this is kind of my philosophy of math communication. So it's that uh, many geeks know that there's an XKCD comic for every occasion. Um, and so this one uh, in the first panel, uh, he's saying, I try not to make fun of people um, for admitting that they don't know things, because each thing everyone knows by the time they're adults, every day there are, on average, 10,000 people in the U.S. who are hearing about it for the first time. 
Um, and so if, if I make, the next panel says, if I make fun of people, I train them not to tell me when they have those moments and I miss out on the fun. And the person is saying, Diet Coke and Mentos, what's that? Oh man, come on, we are going to the grocery store. Why? You're to one of today's lucky 10,000. So um, yeah, so I really like to you know, have an attitude that's about sharing the joy of, of knowledge, not about trying to make people feel like they're less than or not smart because they don't know something already. Because yeah, I'll, none of us knew it as babies and some of us know it now. So like at some point you go from being the person who didn't know it to being the person who did know it. So this really shapes a lot of how I approach this. Um, so uh, this is kind of the scoldy part of the lecture, I guess. Um, kind of some mistakes, which basically means like things that I do all the time and have to train myself not to do. Um, one mistake is assuming that everyone's going to read all of what you write. Uh, so I, I'm like really a secrety person. Like I really like surprises and saving things for the end and like the big reveal at the end. And I've had to like really train myself not to do that when I'm doing math and science writing because if you wait till the end for the fun part, then they probably like they've probably gone over to XKCD or Vihart's videos already instead of staying on your article. Um, and you know, I, I think a lot of my attitude about that was shaped by teaching, where the people in your classroom I, they don't have to be there, but they have to be there more than some person on the internet reading your article does. Um, they're they're graded in some way at the end. Um, another mistake, though, I think, is thinking that people don't like math and won't read things about math. Um, and th this attitude, like, you have to sneak math in, like, spinach into brownies or something like that. Um, and I've actually found that, like, there's a big market for math writing, um, especially, like, things that like dig into the idea some and help people see the, the way mathematicians approach the subject. Um, you know, it doesn't all have to be pictures of the Fibonacci spiral, as beautiful as that is. Um, but like there, there, is, uh, there are a lot of people who want to know about that. And I think mathematicians and science uh, writers and scientists and stuff can kind of have a chip on their shoulder thinking like, oh, no one wants this, we're so persecuted. And it's not true, they like it. Um, something that I, I think I had kind of this macho thing going on in maybe as a, a defense mechanism when I was doing research was that I, I felt like if it seemed really complicated then people would think I was really smart. Um, and in <laughs> math and science writing this is the opposite of, of doing a good job. Because um, basically when you do that if you're using a lot of jargon that people don't understand or or acting like, oh, you should already understand it instead of like, you're the lucky 10,000. Um, they're just gonna think you're an out of touch jerk and they will think that math isn't for them. And that's, that gives me a sad, that's not what I want. Um, another problem that I really had to address in myself, it, it, it makes me nervous to say this even, is um, any sacrifice of accuracy, rigor, or generality is unacceptable. So mathematicians can be very, very, meticulous and demanding about exactly, you know, oh, this, in this case it does this, in this case it does that. And, you know, I'm very invested in saying things accurately, but you can't always say every single thing that is true about something. You know, if you were, then you would just be the research paper, not the 800 word article about the research paper. Um, and basically, people aren't going to read the whole thing people often don't have the background to understand the thing if they do go and read it. Um, and if they wanted a textbook, they would just go read a textbook. Um, or if they wanted to read the scientific article, they'd just go read the scientific article. So there's really an art to how much detail to go into where you can kind of give a general idea of things maybe and not go into the full depth of something. Um, and the, another thing that I think is really widespread is what's called the deficit model of science communication. Just kind of this idea that like, oh, my readers need me to pour knowledge into their brains. Um, and by reading this article, that's what's going to happen, which is a really arrogant way to approach it and not like the lucky 10,000 kind of way to approach it. Um, 
And it's also ineffective, uh, according to people who study science communication. Um, so what to do instead? My, basically, most of my tips boil down to, like, everyone's a human, and so, like, Talk to them like they're humans. Tell them stories, because humans like stories. Um, you know, show them emotions and humanity. <laughs> um, so the, the end of this is kind of some tips that are definitely easier said than done, um, and, you know, things I strive for. Um, the first thing, you know, if you're looking at any kind of math or science communication is thinking about your audience. Who is going to be reading this, have they taken calculus? Have they taken graduate level classes? Have they taken, you know, was algebra two in 10th grade the last time they saw math? Um, you know, are they going to be happy that they're reading about math or are they going to be scared and you need to be like super nice to them? Um, telling stories is really uh, important. People respond to stories. Um, I think as a mathematician, I really didn't feel like telling stories at first, um, but as I've tried to work more narrative and things like that in, it's really been rewarding. Um, sharing feelings is also good. Like uh, the um, introduction mentioned My Favorite Theorem, a podcast that I co-host um, with Kevin Knudsen, and in each one we ask a mathematician about their favorite theorem and ask them to, you know, tell us why they like it, like how does it make them feel basically. So, you know, this sounds like people who are maybe making fun of, like, I don't know, wishy-washy math education or something. Like, oh, how does the math make you feel? But, like, people, we're empathetic creatures and we respond to other people's emotions. And seeing, you know, the, the way... Uh, mathematicians have been very uh, excited about their work and really help other people get excited about it too, which is the share other people's feelings part of this. Um, I really try to limit the number of new ideas I give people at a time, because um, once again, if they wanted the full thing, they'd go read a textbook instead, um, and be like very thoughtful about, you know, when you're defining uh, new terms, do you really need to use it or could you use a description instead? Um, don't use jargon or LaTeX or LaTeX, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, you know, not a lot of equations, not a lot of jargon and stuff. In, you know, once again, the first one of these is audience, audience, audience. So depending on your audience, jargon might be very appropriate. But for the kind of um, general audience writing that I do, um, trying to limit jargon and my first day at Scientific American, I was like, oh, where's the MathJax plug-in? There's a way to, to typeset math equations on, like, on a WordPress platform or um, you know, on the internet. And they kind of looked at me like, what is that? And when I explained what it was, they're like, why would we need that? Um, and that was really a good kind of uh, perspective shift for me that like, oh yeah, I'm not teaching, I'm not writing a textbook here. Like, I'm communicating about the ideas, not about the details. Um, related to the, the thing about people aren't going to read the whole thing, there are a lot of demands on attention, and you want to put the good stuff at the top, um, which I didn't do because the next slide is even better than this one. Um, make it pretty. Like The better your graphics are, the more eye-catching they can be. That's great. Don't limit your medium. Um, some of the best math writing I've seen has been in like comics. Um, I don't know, XKCD is definitely a fun one. SMBC, I, they're all four letter acronyms, or XKCD isn't even an acronym because it doesn't stand for anything. But yeah, um, I've seen great math communication in those, um, and so it's nice to like have a wide range of that. The la yeah, the best tip is to use pictures of cats. This is from one of my favorite articles that I've written. Um, which is, was about using what are called Julia sets, which is a kind of fractal, to um, approximate any shape that you want. And so the author took a picture of her cat and like outlined the picture and like used this method that she had come up with to approximate the cat using these fractals. Basically the best thing that ever happened to the internet, right? Um, so, so yeah, if you can work in like cat pictures or memes, you know, I try, 
you know, that the Inigo Montoya, like that doesn't mean what you think it means meme. That's a good one for, for things. Uh, or the, the most interesting man in the world um, kind of thing. I, I try to, you know, I, I'm hip to the youth. Um, <laughs> yeah, they, oh yeah, I'm glad the, the big laugh was for like me being out of touch, great. Um, <laughs> so yeah, the, my very last page of tips is about like, you know, so those, those are kind of all these big ideas, but like, I don't know about you, but sometimes I sit down and I'm like, okay, I have a document open on my screen how, how, where do the words come from? Um, and so like my mental preparation for writing, um, a lot of it is planning, like before you start, what do you want people, like when someone reads this, what do you want them to know? Or what do you want them to think about? Finding the good quotes, um, you know, if you've talked with a researcher and they said something really funny or insightful, you know, figure out how to stick those in. Find analogies. If you can make your researcher give you analogies, that's great. Sometimes they don't want to do that. Um, then you actually have to write words down. Just like write anything. <laughs> Just try to start writing words that are related to what you're writing about. This is like my best writing tip, right? Write words down on the page. <laughs> um, if you're writing about math, check the arithmetic. Uh, this is a do as I say, not as I do, because I don't know how many times I've been embarrassed because I have some ridiculous arithmetic mistake, you know, in my thing. And often, this is a problem, like if an editor knows I have a math background, they're too intimidated to tell me that it looks like the arithmetic is wrong. Because like, oh, obviously, if she has a PhD in math, she couldn't possibly make a, an arithmetic error. And they don't know, like the most, the saddest thing to ever happen at a restaurant is a table of mathematicians trying to, to like split the bill. This is, this is a very sad thing because they, they just are bad at it. I'm sorry. I don't want to say anyone is bad at things, but yeah, I go to dinner with mathematicians a lot. I'm married to a mathematician. We have mathematician friends and it is, yeah. Check the arithmetic a lot. I use a calculator for the, the most ridiculous things that like if I were teaching, I would be like, don't use a calculator for that. But like I use it because I know that I make me these mistakes. Um, it's really, editing is a beautiful thing. It's also very painful because people tear up your work and say that you're not saying what you think you're saying. Um, but it's great and it makes you, your writing so much better. Um, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> I tell myself when I'm crying in the fetal position because someone made me feel bad because nothing that I meant was what they understood. Um, so I, I try to get, uh, as I said, I'm married to a mathematician, so um, I often get him to read my work to kind of may not check the arithmetic because he's no good for that, um, but check other math ideas <laughs> he's, he's better at. Um, and also, you know, if you can get it edited by uh, people who aren't specialists in the field and will know um, what your audience doesn't know. And then at the end of the piece, kind of the moment of truth, like you read it and you're like, okay, when someone reads this, do they get out of it what I thought they would get out of it at the beginning? And if, if not, you know, is it because my purpose changed or is it because, you know, I didn't do a good job of it or, or didn't do the job that I wanted to do of it? Um, and then the final one, especially if your writing appears on the internet, um, is to have a thick skin because um, people are going to, well, first of all, they're going to email you with a variety of, of degrees of civility about those arithmetic mistakes that you made. Um, actually, the, the most, most people who, who point out mistakes like that to me are pretty nice. Um, but then sometimes they're not so nice. And then sometimes they just think you're terrible for existing. Um, and they'll let you know that because that was an important thing for them to do with their day. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I developed a really thick skin pretty early. I mean, I do complain to my spouse a lot about it. Um, and he has a much thinner skin about people criticizing me than I do at this point. Um, so I know that I can get some good outrage out of him if uh, someone was particularly mean to me. Um, so uh, you know, getting a PhD in math uh, and then teaching for a few years before deciding you don't want to do that is not the only way <laughs> to be a math and science writer. Um, 
probably not the best way, definitely not the shortest way. Um, and so I wanted to uh, put a few places there that, you know, if you're interested or curious about math and science writing, some resources that you can uh, look at. There are degree programs that have, um, you know, of course you can get a journalism degree at many, many places, but uh, there are some places that have special, uh, specifically science writing degrees. Um, and then publications have internships. Um, there are conferences and books and things that I recommend. Um, organizations, the National Association of Science Writers, um, the CASW that ends in science writers, and I don't remember what the first two are. Uh, it has a lot of funding opportunities for science writing, though, so um, other things like that. So uh, yeah, and then I remember how I said part of my job was self-promotion, so now here's the self-promotion slide that I'll end with, um, which is where you can find my writing um, and where you can read my ridiculous math jokes that I make on Twitter. Um, so yeah, thanks, and I hope if you want to talk about science writing, feel free to a ask questions or talk to me after. Yes. What's my favorite math joke? Oh, gosh. I mean, so seven, eight, nine is a classic. <laughs> like, it really, it, it's like, yeah, it's a pretty special one. That's, I should have an answer for that, but I, I'm gonna go with seven, eight, nine. Okay, there's another one that um, the kid of one of my friends told me. Um, what did zero say to eight? Nice belt. I think, yeah, someone here has heard that one. Yeah, so that's a good one, too. I, I'm into the numeral-based humor. Um, yeah, but yeah, I'll, I'll laugh at most math jokes. Don't test me. But. Yeah. Yes, the last class I taught at the U was complex analysis, the undergraduate complex analysis class. Um, complex analysis is so great. Uh, yeah, you should go take it, I, or if you haven't already. Um, yeah, it's fantastic. The, so the, a complex number, you've heard of I, the square root of negative one. Um, so complex numbers are like a combination of a real number with a complex number, so like three plus four I would be a complex number. And you wouldn't think that doing that would be like such a brain explosion thing, but like when you like do calculus in, with complex numbers instead of real numbers, it's like this whole new world opens up. It's so great. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not gonna give a complex analysis lecture right now, but I would. My, what is my favorite field of mathematics? I think that would have to be geometry. I really like shapes. I was actually um, not into numbers. Uh, so even though my, my math jokes are all about numerals, um, maybe that's just because I think numbers are laughable or something. But I was never attracted to number theory. I never took a number theory class, although I, I have actually taught it. Um, but I mean, I learned it. It's not like I didn't know what I was doing by the time I taught it, but like I learned it separately from uh, a class. Um, but yeah, I, I wasn't really attracted to number theory. I'm not terribly interested in, in some of the com like computer science and combinatorics type problems. The geometry is, is my favorite. And geometry has a lot of complex analysis in it too. Another ad for complex analysis. Yeah. Uh, so the question was, do I still get to sit down and do a lot of math problems? The answer is not a lot, um, but there's a thing called nerd sniping, um, which is when you distract someone who is somewhat nerdy um, by giving them a, a problem, and this does happen to me. So like, I don't have a lot of time to like sit down and work out math problems, but sometimes I will see something where like this problem will grab my brain and I just like can't go on until I've solved it. Um, 
I, I'm sure a lot of people in this room have had this experience as well. Um, but no, I don't do a, sit down and do a lot of math problems. Um, sometimes for my writing, it does come up where I'm going to need to like test some little calculation or um, I've done some editing work on math, like popular math books and so I'll need to go through and like if they present a problem, I need to make sure that's correct and so I need to kind of do it on my own way and make sure it, it works out. Um, but yeah, I don't do a ton of that. And I, I actually don't miss it that much because I think I really like the part of it where you learn about the new thing a lot and so I get to do a lot of that instead. But I do get nerd sniped sometimes. It's a thing. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, um, what, you know, how is it for women in math, kind of? Um, and I really had mostly good experiences. Um, I uh, was lucky that no, none of my superiors ever sexually harassed me. It's sad that I, that I have to say that I was lucky that that was the case. But it is a very common experience um, that I thankfully didn't have. Um, and I always felt very supported by... Um, older men in math uh, who, you know, uh, mentored me and uh, helped me find career things, wrote a lot of recommendation letters for me for things. Um, so I had mostly positive experiences. Um, I, the fact that I'm white probably helps with that because um, it is, you know, intersectionality, uh, like racism can combine with sexism to make things a lot worse for women of color. Um, and so I know that white privilege is part of why my experiences were so good. Um, and then part of it was, was luck, I think. Um, I, I did have times where I felt like I was being pushed more into education instead of a research track. Um, I think that's a thing that can happen to women where, you know, it is like people helping you find opportunities and things, but assuming that you're going to be interested in a certain thing instead of another. Um, and I, I know that's a thing that happens. Um, it, when I was teaching, um, the, the students at the U were mostly pretty great, but the one thing is my husband is never called by his first name. Um, and I was called by my first name a lot. And my students, I, I introduced myself as Dr. Lamb um, because as a young woman, I felt like I needed to make sure that I established that kind of authority and my students still called me by my first name would still ask me when I was graduating, even though I introduced myself as Dr. Lamb, it's like, there's not something after doctor, like, that's the most. <laughs> um, and so, you know, that, it was something that was fairly easy to kind of shrug off, and I always, um, you know, would sign, sign things, that, you know, using the title, and it, it's one of those things, I'm not naturally a person who wants to enforce that kind of hierarchy, but in the position that I was as a young woman teaching math, it was kind of important for me to do that somewhat. Um, so, so yeah, mostly positive experiences, a few small things, but um, I know a lot of people have had bad experiences. I do think it's changing. I, I do think the, um, like there's more and more awareness of this as a problem, even among people who might not naturally have been receptive to it as a problem at first, and that's really heartening to see. How would I use crowdsourcing and geocaching to use Euler's theorem? Um, so, are uh, like our. So, are you proposing like this is a way that one could do it that wouldn't require huge ropes, or so? So the, the idea of of using the Euler formula is like, if you were able to divide the the Earth into a bunch of regions, like using you know grabbing a penguin and some rope, and um, making regions like that. Um, but yeah, I guess you could do geocaching, like if you had a bunch of, like some big geocache day and like everyone did it if you were, although this is relying on GPS, which already assumes that the Earth is a sphere. 
Yeah, maybe that wouldn't work. Because I was saying, like, oh, then you could, like, connect the lines between the people who have the geocaches. But, like, that kind of, or I was saying meta metaphorical lines, like, on GPS. But GPS already uses the fact that the Earth is a sphere. And so a, a hardcore flat earther would probably not accept that as proof. But I, yeah, I actually don't, I don't know if flat earthers use GPS. Um, <laughs> they, yeah. It, it might be, it might be difficult. You'd have to give all the geocachers ropes, I think, to really be satisfied. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess, I guess if you could see each other, you could kind of use the laser light as a line, yeah. <laughs> 